well, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me, uh, and welcome to my talk about hands-free uh, coding with gaze detection in JavaScript. Um, so, before I dive into the topic, I just want to say that this project, in this project, I'm exploring. Um, it's not intended for production. I know that most of the time uh, at conferences, you want to be able to take what you learn and go back to work tomorrow and implement it. But that's not that's not really about that. My motivation here is um, to experiment with different ways to write code and think about what it would look like to, to write code with other things than the keyboard. So let's, you know, we're going to need to use our imagination uh, a little bit in this talk, but hopefully you'll, you'll learn something and it will give you some, some ideas of what you can do um, in JavaScript. So I've already been introduced, but, you know, just in case quickly, uh, my name is Charlie Gerard. I'm a senior front-end developer at Netlify. Uh, a Google Dev expert in web technologies. Um, I, you know, last year I wrote a book uh, called Practical Machine Learning in JavaScript, and I love to make random things with JavaScript. So the main language that I work with is, uh, is uh, JS, and the project that I'm going to talk about in this talk is my most recent one. Um, so the inspiration for this talk and uh, and project comes from the experiment Look to Speak by Sarah Ezekiel and Google Creative Labs. So it's an Android app, which enables people to use their eyes to select pre-written phrases and have them spoken aloud. So it's intended for people with restricted mobility to be able to communicate more easily with other people. So by looking left and right, you select phrases you'd like to be, um, to be spoken aloud. So looking a bit more closely at the UI, we can see that the app has a phrase book in which you can write phrases you're most likely to use. Then the UI is split in two columns and uh, it uses the direction of the user's gaze through the phone's camera to filter down the list until there's only one option available to speak. So I thought that this way of setting up the interaction was really uh, interesting because I've worked before on interfaces to help people communicate with uh, eye direction and a brain sensor as well. But I, I was doing it kind of wrong, or at least in a very inefficient way, because I was reproducing the keyboard we're used to using with our fingers, but to be used with other body parts. And it wasn't really the correct way to think about solving this problem. So one example of a project that I built um, four years ago is this one that I called um, Teachable Keyboard. And you select letters on a keyboard by tilting uh, your head in different directions. So I quickly trained a machine learning algorithm to recognize the direction of my head using the webcam feed. Uh, but you can imagine that the amount of words or phrases I'd be able to type in a minute would be uh, much longer than if I was splitting the keyboard in two and filtering down the, the list each time I tilt my head. For example, if I wanted to write the letter M that's at the end of the keyboard in this example, I'd have to wait until it goes through 26 letters. However, if I was splitting the list or this layout in two columns of 13 letters each, if I wanted to go all the way down to the letter M, I'd only have to tilt my head four or five times maximum, which would allow me to write words much faster. So after coming across the uh, Android app that I talked about in, in the previous slide, uh, I tried it. Uh, and I got really impressed with how accurately you could track gaze direction. So obviously I thought I have to try to recreate this uh, in JavaScript. So look to speak, you know, it's an Android app, but I love to see how far I can push things that can be built with web technologies. So I spent some time doing that. So the initial result was this one. So I used a machine learning model with TensorFlow.js to do, uh, you know, gaze detection and implemented some kind of keyboard interface to write words with my eyes. So this experiment uh, is live. I can share the, the link uh, later if, uh, if you want. But I think around the same time, I heard of a project by Josh Como to implement hands-free coding, but with voice detection. So if you're interested, I'd recommend reading uh, his blog post. He's also using eye tracking as a mouse replacement, but he's using an external device plugged into his computer. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I want to try and see if we can use the built-in webcam. Uh, I love to work with the constraint of doing with what I have, which is, you know, not much. If I just have a laptop, can I? What can I do, you know, with it? So, you know, I the limitations that I found in his project is that, you know, when you use voice detection, you kind of have no privacy in some environments. If you wanted to code at the library or in the train or in a cafe, you would be speaking out loud the words of your program, which 
could be a little bit weird. And I thought, well, if I do it with my eyes, well, I would look weird, but I can still try to like hide. And it's a bit more uh, discreet. And also the limitation of having to buy an additional camera is something that I want to be able to build projects with like the minimum amount of, uh, you know, money or, or devices that I can have. So to uh, achieve my project, I started thinking about how we write programs. And what I mean by that is that I spent some time thinking about the, the syntax of programming, and I'm only going to talk about JavaScript in this case. But there's only a certain amount of words or reserved words that you can use in different programming languages. And there's also a specific amount of comments you can try to execute. And this could become like our phrase book. Uh, a lot of the times you start by declaring variables, and then you also have functions, and you have import and export statements. Um, you have logs when you want to see what's going on. You can have like return statements to have access to values later on when you call your functions. You have logical operators and then logical statements and also a lot of web APIs. There's more, but you know, that would take the entire talk if I could, uh, you know, if I was listing all the types of things that we can do in programming. But then even if we break down these, um, th this kind of like functionality that we can write in our programs, we can still, there's only a certain way of doing things as well. For example, for variables in JavaScript, you have var, const, and let. And then for functions, you have function declarations and then function call. But in the way you can write functions, you have like your arrow functions or anonymous functions or immediately invoked function expressions. Uh, for import statements, you can have like import or non, uh, sorry, default import or non default, and same for export. For logs, you have console log, console table, console group, probably more that I never use. But, um, but for return statement, you only have like return, but you could group that into another thing. Uh, for logical operators, like you could, you know, add, subtract, divide, a logical statement, you know, you can have like your loops and if, else, and while, but there's only a certain amount of it. And for web APIs, you have, you know, the fetch, get user media, web web API, same. I'm not going to go into the full list. But you can see that you, you don't write programs exactly in like an infinite amount of ways. Uh, what you can do with programming is, you know, uh, like you can build a lot of things. But in terms of the syntax uh, that, that you use, there is a, a finite list. So now that we reflect a little bit on uh, the syntax uh, of programming in JavaScript, we, we can see that we could create some kind of phrasebook of commonly used coding patterns but then, okay, so we kind of have that part uh, figured out. You know, it reminds me of the phrase book of the Android app. But now what about the gaze detection part of the project? So I'm using three main tools, uh, TensorFlow.js for the gaze detection, Electron to make a little desktop app for my interface, and Robot.js to emulate keyboard inputs sent from the Electron app to VS Code. So to dive a little bit more into how uh, my project is built, let's look at a few code samples. So to do the gaze detection, I start by importing the face landmarks detection machine learning model that is part of the TensorFlow open source models, as well as a couple of um, TensorFlow JS um, packages. Then I have a function, you know, that loads my model to be able to used in the rest uh, to be used in the rest of my program. And then I have a function to set up the camera feed using get user, the get user media API, but I'm not going to go into details here because this part of the code is not directly related to uh, machine learning. It's more of a standard web API you might have used um, already. Again, if you know, this is just a, a code sample, um, the, the important thing here is to understand the, um, the process, my, my, you know, thought process in how I built this and the different steps to make it happen. You know, understanding the, the code or knowing it by heart is, is really not the point here. Uh, but then in another function, once the model is loaded, I call the estimate faces method, passing a few different parameters, including the video feed, so my camera, and the predict RSs as true, so I can have access to the coordinates of my eyes on the screen. Once I get the predictions detected in the video feed, you know, I don't want to execute that code if, the, if my face is not detected in the feed. Um, I loop through my predictions and I access the data points that I'm interested in. So the predictions come back as an object with different properties, like where your mouth is located, the nose, the eyes, etc. And I access the X and Y coordinate of my left iris relative to the width of the video feed. 
So, you know, so when I move my head around, uh, you know, uh, in front of my camera, then the coordinates will change depending on when it's predicting that my eyes are. Then I also calculate the X and Y coordinate of the bounding box of my face on the screen. Um, and to be able to calculate the direction of my gaze, I need to know the, the position of my iris in relation to the border of my face. Uh, so that, you know, I, I want to know when I look straight, the distance between the border of my face and my eye is a certain number. And then if it increases, then I'm looking right. And if it decreases, I'm looking left. Um, yeah, so then if I detect that my full face is on the screen, so if it sees the border left, um, you know, you could also see, you know, you could add that it also needs to see the border right, but you know, that's the prototype code. So I didn't uh, handle all the cases. Um, so if I see that my face is on the screen, then I can do some calculation to try to get a normalized value of the X coordinate of my left iris so that I can come closer or further away to the camera and it would still work. So you can imagine that if I didn't normalize the value, if I got closer to the camera, the distance between my left iris and the left side of my face would get smaller, um, even though I'm not actually would get bigger. Even though I'm not looking in a certain direction, the value would become bigger if I if I move um, forward because I'm closer, and if I move backwards, it would be um, smaller. But if you normalize the value, I will always get a value between zero and one, no matter the distance of my face to the camera. It means I can move closer or further away from my webcam and the calculation of the gaze direction would still be correct. Um, this way I can decide through trial and error um, that when the normalized value of the distance between my left iris and the left side of my face is uh, more than 0 0.355, then I'm looking right. So my iris is moving to the right. And, um, and when it's less, then I'm looking left. So the closer my iris is to the border of my face, the more, you know, um, I'm probably looking left. Um, you know, that might be different for different people. I don't know, but that was the through trial and error. That was the values that worked for me. Um, so this, all of this code to detect the gaze direction is actually isolated in an NPM package that, uh, that I open sourced that I called a gaze detection. Um, so I could reuse it for multiple projects. So in the project to write code with my eyes, um, so I then import my package, my gaze detection package. I call my load model method to be able to use the, the model in my code. Um, I set up my camera feed, you know, again, not going to go too much into it. Uh, and I start doing, I start, you know, getting my predictions. So I call my get gaze prediction method that returns the gaze direction from, from the package. And then if the direction is right, uh, and if it's different from the previous direction detected, and I'm writing this here because there's multiple predictions per second. Um, and the thing is that if I don't compare the current prediction to the previous one, it might come back as like looking right five times, which is not the case. It's just that the speed at which I move my eyes is slower than the predictions that I'm getting. So I'm just making sure that, um, that I avoid triggering the code multiple times when the act intended by the user is to look right once. Then uh, here, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm, I'm slicing my array of options that I'm showing on the screen to only select the half selected by the user, and then I update the UI. Um, and same for the left direction. So I keep doing this until there's only one option left, so the one that I want. So what happens next? So to keep it short, I use uh, Electron's IPC renderer module that is used to communicate asynchronously from a renderer process to the main process to send the command that I that I want. So um, RCE would be to create a React component or then the command tab, if I'm actually selecting with my eyes the tab option, I'm sending that to the main renderer and then to so the main process, sorry. And then in the main process, I use the robot.js package to emulate the keyboard input. So if I'm sending the command tab, then you know I use robot.js, uh, the key tab tab to actually send that to VS Code. Um, so that was like a lot. And again, it's like snippets of the, of the code that actually creates the project. But uh, the final result is this. So you can see VS Code with an empty JS file on the left and then the browser preview in the middle and my Electron app UI on the right. Um, so what I did is that, well, you can see here that I put my hands in front of my face just to prove that I wasn't using the keyboard and that um, this very, very small React component is created 
with uh, with my eyes. So it's only a component that renders the string high, but you could, um, you know, and in, in less than 30 seconds, I have something rendered on the screen. And you can see that I'm filtering letters. And at the very beginning, I have, you know, I'm showing uh, different options. And what I did for this is I actually used um, a VS Code uh, add-on for React snippets that you might already be using. Uh, when you type, you know, R, C, E, and tab, it creates a React component. Well, I use these same options, but in my UI. So you might already be able to kind of pair things that you use in VS Code and just like use the same concept in, in my UI. Um, so yeah, so here in this little, uh, in this very short example, you could see that I could add more features to, you know, be able to write hooks with my eyes or, you know, but I just wanted to see if it was possible. And uh, well, hopefully you can see that. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so what about the, the limits? Because, you know, I often get excited about what can be built, but I also want to talk about the, um, some of, you know, some of the difficult things that I came across, or now that I've been playing with this, I kind of know where the limitations are. So there's there's a little bit. So currently, you can't it can't be built directly into uh, VS Code as an extension. My original idea, I would have loved to be able to just add, uh, build that as an extension, but then I quickly realized you can't access the webcam feed in as a VS Code uh, extension, probably for security uh, purposes, and also because it's an Electron app, so it's Node.js, so you don't have access directly to. Um, actually, you do have access. I'm um, yeah. uh, So <laughs> it's just that I tried and it didn't work. Um, so, but in a way, maybe it's good because then it means that as an Electron app, uh, an independent one, I can then use that app with more things than VS Code. If you still use like Atom, that would work. Or it means that you can use that code as a, a Chrome extension and you could write it on Code Sandbox. Or, you know, it means that you can use that code and, and on, in different environments and not only in VS Code. So another limit is that the UI requires an initial setup with correct code snippets. So I used code snippets to be able to use, um, to write some React code or, you know, more generally some JavaScript expressions, but you could think that, you know, you could have different modules if you're writing Python or Ruby or, or Java, but they would need an initial setup of the code snippets that you would like to use for your code. Uh, another um, another limit is that there is a learning curve of like learning a new layout. We're very used to typing on the keyboard fast, whereas here you would kind of have to learn where the options are to go fast or how the keyboard works and get used to uh, the interaction. But as you can see, after a few trials, I could write a, a React um, some React code in less than thirty seconds. So it's about you know getting used to a new layout, and it can be a bit. Um, exhausting on the eyes, uh, so I'm not intending to like. This is not intended to be a full replacement of typing with a keyboard, but I think it could be an addition if your hands start the hands start to hurt because you've been typing too much, or if you're having coffee and you're holding the cup with one hand, you can still code with your eyes. I don't know. Uh, and the last uh, the last limitation is that computer vision needs proper light setting. So it works by day, but if you are coding by night and you don't have enough light on your face, then it's going to be difficult for the um, gaze detection um, machine learning model to be able to see your eyes. So, but another, you know, just one last thing before uh, before I, I finish is that a way to go against that is another project that I've been prototyping like very, very early on, but you can then use, you can mix that kind of uh, project that uses gaze detection but with a brain sensor. So instead of using the camera to detect where your eyes are looking in this very, very rough first prototype of, uh, of another project, I actually use the data that comes straight from my brain activity to detect uh, my eyes blinking. And the next step of that project would be to detect um, a right blink and the left blink. Because here in this project, I'm only detecting if I'm doing an international uh, intentional blink. So you could use uh, you know, a brain sensor that detects when I'm blinking like right or left and then use my interface of uh, hands-free coding as well. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that was that was mostly it. Um, you know, it, it was a really uh, interesting thing to be to be looking into. Um, machine learning, there's like a lot of things that can be done with it. And I think it was really interesting to think about to think about how we write code. Um, you know, I didn't really think that much before about 
you know, the semantics of like JavaScript and all that stuff. But I think when you're building an interface of trying like an interface that's different from the keyboard, then you have to think about like, well, how do I write code? What are the expressions I use the most? And, and things like that. Uh, that was an interesting part as well on top of the of the machine learning part. But yeah, anyway, uh, that was it. If you have any uh, question, I am uh, devdevcharlie on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I usually post most of my projects uh, on Twitter. I love to share some weird stuff that I, <laughs> that I try. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it gave you some ideas or it got you excited to maybe try machine learning in, in JavaScript. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. And that's it.